And uh, let's read these selected verses from the first two chapters of Peter. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, like newborn babes, crave pure since milk, so that it may, you may grow up in your salvation. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And this is God's eternal and inspired, life-giving, and life-changing word of God. You may be seated. I have put in bold three letters in those verses that we just read. The word know, and the word grow, and the word proclaim. I'm going to use, instead of the word proclaim, the King James Version. It says that we may show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. The word show, S-H-O-W. There are three key words when we think about the Christian life that uh, will, will help us in living a life that brings honor and glory and praise to our Savior. Three little words. Three little four-letter words. These are good four-letter words. The word know, the word grow, and the word show. Say it with me. Know, grow, and show. Why is it that some Christians seemingly are growing in the Christian life and others do not? Why is it that some Christians seemingly are victorious in the Christian life and others are defeated most of the, most of the time? Why is it that some Christians have the joy of the Lord, which is their strength in life, and others seemingly are just walking around with a sense of depression and discouragement all of the time? I believe as we work through these three letters, these three words today and next Sunday, that we will have a better grip on terms of what God wants us to know and, and grow and and show as we live for Him. And I believe these three little words will change our, our perspective on the Christian life. Last Sunday we started looking at the word know. Knowledge. Knowledge as being the key factor, a key factor in the Christian life. And that our job as a church is to cause people to know and to feel Godward so that they may choose to live a life that is holy and, and godly and glorious before the Lord. And that's what chapter 1 is all about. If you will take that outline that I gave you, you will note that there is a mistake in uh, those ten little, nine little words under no. Uh, there are supposed to be not ten words rather than nine. One is redeemed, two is strangers, three is scattered, and four is hope, and five is inheritance. And on the next list, it's five again. I told you I was a redneck. I really can't count. And so, uh, scratch out one of those fives. Six will be kept. Seven will be trials, and eight will be joy, nine will be holy, and ten will be love. Those are the words that I want to reflect upon with you for just a few moments this morning. That there are some things that if we are to live the Christian life, we just need to know. 
We looked at the first three last Sunday. We need to know that we are born again, Peter says. If we are going to live the Christian life, we need to know that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. There are so many people who claim to be a Christian. There are so many people who are trying to live the Christian life. So many people in churches much like ours, but they have never been born again. I can't tell you how many times over the years that people in the church where I have pastored, they've come to me and we've had a time of prayer and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And though they've been in the church all of their lives, they would say this was the first time they trusted Jesus as their Savior. Do you want to be a Christian? Do you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Then Peter says there, you just need to know that you have been born again. And you can know that. You can know that by placing your faith and trust in Jesus to be your Savior. And then, having done that, Peter starts the book with a whole litany of things that we just need to know if we're going to live successfully for the Lord. We need to know that we are strangers. We are strangers in enemy territory, as we saw last week. We need to know that we are scattered strangers. That we have been placed where we are providentially, not randomly. God has not forgotten us, but He has placed us right where we are for a, a divine purpose. And these three words will help us understand what our purpose is. Especially next week as we look at growing and showing. And now today we pick up with that list. Know that you've been born again. Know that you are a stranger. Know that you are scattered with a purpose in life. And then Peter says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so circle that little word hope. We need to know that as we are strangers in enemy territory, even though we know that God has a purpose for us, that in the midst of all of this, we have a hope. Peter says it is a living hope. It is a living hope because we have a living Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of, the uh, of Jesus Christ from the dead, that's just one side of our hope that's alive. The other side is found in verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon that, the grace that is to be brought to you at the resurrection, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so there's the other side of our living hope. The first side is that we have a living Savior. Jesus Christ arose from the grave. And on the other side of that living hope is that one day you and I are going to be resurrected from the grave. Our hope is alive. Our hope is eternal. Our hope is that we're going to be in the presence of Jesus Christ for all eternity. What a marvelous thing to know. Do you know that? Do you know that one day you will see Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, and one day our bodies, our defiled, de de decaying bodies will one day be resurrected and we will be in His presence. There is a song that goes uh, something like this. I'll not sing it. But it is that wonderful song that says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand his oath his covenant and blood support me in the whelming flood when every earthly prop gives way he then is my all my hope and stay on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand and dear friend, that's one of the things, that's one of the pieces of our knowledge as a believer we need to have deepened into our heart. 
that Jesus Christ is our hope. And because He is our hope, we too have the hope of being able to see Him as He is in the resurrection. It was Vance Havner, that great North Carolinian preacher of a generation ago, who said one time, the hope of dying is the only thing that keeps me alive. <laughs> what a marvelous truth that is. The hope of dying <laughs> is the only thing that keeps us going from time to time, from week to week, from day to day, knowing that our hope is in the resurrection. I hope you know that. Peter wants you to know that. Know that you've been born again. Know that you're strangers. Know that you're scattered in enemy territory for a purpose. And know that you have a hope to look forward to. There is a future for the child of God. And now look down in verse 4. He says, to, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away. Where is it? Reserved in heaven for you. Remember the words of Jesus when he said to his disciples, I'm going to leave you, but I will come again. But while I am gone, I will be preparing those mansions for you. It's being reserved in heaven for you. How is it described? It's an inheritance. It's an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away. One scholar put it this way. That word incorruptible means not ravaged by, an, by a foreign enemy army. Oh, what a picture that is. When we all get to heaven, in that inheritance that is ours, it will not be invaded by an enemy army. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled, meaning it's not polluted. I mean, the Greenpeace people down here on earth, if they make it to heaven, they're going to have a glorious time in heaven. It will be pure, unpolluted, and not fading away, meaning no change, no decay, life never fades or corrupts. About a year and a half ago, Jerry Ann and I moved into a retirement community. We have a little apartment in, in a large community for, for old folks. And uh, we were thinking about what were we going to do in our retirement years. We had moved... Uh, we had moved 20 times over our marriage years during the past. And so we were thinking about this, that, or the other. And we started thinking about retirement communities where you would go and they sell you on this thing. All of your worries will be over. No more painting of the house. No more fixing the shingles. No more repairing of the appliances. No more removing the snow. And uh, that's what we bought into. But even there, there are problems. But one day, we are going to move into that inheritance that has been reserved for us in heaven. It's incorruptible, undefiled, and fades not away. What a glorious truth that is. To know that as we live down here on the earth, that I have been born again, that I am a stranger in enemy territory, that God has placed me here for a purpose. And that as we live here, that we have a hope that's going to pull us through until we find that reservation in heaven where that inheritance is given to us. And it's reserved in heaven. It's reserved in heaven. And that reservation takes place when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. When you go on a trip... You make a reservation at a place, a motel, or wherever you're going. And so it is with heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Have you made your reservation? Oh, I'm here today. This is Sunday. This is the church, and I'm a preacher. Please, if you have not placed your reservation in heaven, do it now. Do it today. Trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior. I went to my doctor a while back, had some kind of issue going on, and as he was examining me, he, he turned to me at last and said, Lee, 
uh, my diagnosis for you is TMB. TMB? I said, Dr. Tom, what is TMB? He said, too many birthdays. <laughs> So I guess I've got that disease of TMB, too many birthdays. But one day when I get to that reservation, it's not going to matter how many birthdays we have. This old body will be changed. There's going to be a new body. And uh, it will never corrupt and decay. There's a little chorus that we used to sing in churches. A tent or a cottage. Why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still may I sing. All glory to God. I'm a child of the King. Oh, what an inheritance. You know, it's just a simple truth that we as believers know, but we need to have it warm our heart from time to time. That we're just on a journey. This world's not our home. We're headed for that inheritance reserved in heaven. And then Peter has something else to say for us to know. Some things we just need to know. Lest we get sidetracked down here on the earth. We need to know what is found in verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Ready to be revealed for the last time. Circle that little word kept. Or maybe it's the word preserved in your translation, whatever translation you use. It has the idea that we are secure in this process, in this journey. Even if we're going it alone, we are kept by the power of God. Oh, what a marvelous truth that is. That we are secure in Him. You know, I believe in eternal security. That when you come and place your faith in Jesus Christ... You will be forever a child of God. But I didn't always believe that. I grew up as a child with having placed my faith in Jesus when I was five years of age. Uh, but you know, when I was going through my teenage years, and I, I would come to the church, and I would get convicted, and I'd say, Lord, if I didn't mean it last week, I mean it this week. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I mean, you just, you just know that something's wrong in your life and you come back to the altar, you come back to the cross, you come back to Jesus and you cry out like you're crying out for salvation all fresh and anew. Lord, if I didn't mean it last week, I mean it this week. It was only when I was in Bible college that I began to study some of the teachings of Jesus that he's not, we're, all, we're forever in his family, that we are kept by the power of God, that we will not be lost, we will not be forsaken. He's not an Indian giver. He's not going to give us a gift and then take it away. It was only then that I came to realize and be, 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 be satisfied in, in the, the knowledge that we're kept. And that's okay. Maybe you're going through one of those what I call childhood experiences with your faith. Where we have to come from time to time and just, just come back to the Savior. Come back to Jesus as though we were starting all over again. There's that emotional support that we need when we come to the cross and cry out to Jesus, Lord, if you didn't do it last week, do it this week. Come into my heart and be my Savior. But as we, as we grow in the Lord, as we'll talk about next week, we begin to understand some of these things that we just need to know. We need to drive the truth of God's work of grace in our hearts deep down into our hearts that we are kept by the power of God. For we will go through situations of life and we will wonder. We will wonder if there is indeed a God. And if there is indeed a God, why is this happening to me? We just need to know that we are kept in the midst of it all. You see, we're on a journey. We need to know some things. We need to know that uh, we are people on the earth who have a wonderful hope. A wonderful reservation. And while we're going through this journey, we are kept by our Heavenly Father. Verses 6, 7, and 8 really talk about, talk about the sufferings that we are going to have in life. In fact, the book of 1 Peter can, is, really like, is really the New Testament uh, counterpart to the Old Testament Job. He talks about suffering in the life of the believer time and time again. And this is where it comes up. 
suffering. I like to call First Peter the syllabus for suffering saints. And uh, we will come back to this in a, in a, in a later message about suffering in, as a Christian. But here's the introduction to it from Peter. In this you greatly rejoice. <laughs> What's he talking about? The suffering that he's going to talk, talk about? No, it's, it's in this. He, he's referring back to what has just been said in verse 5. That we are kept by the power of God. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Circle the little word trials. Because though we are Christians and children of God and have this eternal inheritance, we are not exempt from trials and troubles and tests of life. We'll come back to this in a future message. But I want, to know, I want you to notice three things about our trials from this perspective. In this, for a little while, our trials are going to be temporary. Just for a little while. I, I went to the doctor for a little test this week and I had to, I, I had to have a, a shot. The doctor said, it's going to hurt for just a little bit. That's the way trials are. They're going to hurt for just a little while. They're temporary. They're not going to last forever. Trials are temporary. For a little while, if need be. The little word if is a conditional word. It's a, it's a word that, that speaks of a condition of certainty. Not only are these trials temporary, but they are necessary. They are needed in our lives while we're going through this journey here. Uh, you have been grieved by various trials. And the word you in the Greek is in the plural form. Our trials are not only temporary and necessary, they are ordinary. Everybody, every believer will go through trials. If you're here today and you've never experienced a trial of your life or faith, just hang on, it's going to be happening to you. These are the trials that we experience. And we need to know that. Lest we be shocked and surprised when they happen to us. And be used by the devil to bring us down to defeat and even denial of our faith. And so Peter is helping us out a little bit here. Uh, there are three words that are important. They're like mental pegs. We need to, we need to hang the Christian life on. No, grow, show. You need to know that you're born again. You need to know that you're a stranger in enemy territory. You need to know that God has placed you there. You need to know that while you're there, there's, there's a great hope. We're going to be resurrected. And we have, a, we have a reservation in heaven. And we need to know that while we go through the life experience down here, we are kept by the power of God, but in the midst of it all, there will be trials and troubles. Job says man is born into trouble just as the sparks of the fly, fire fly upward. Troubles sometimes can be our middle name. And then let me quickly go to the next word in verse 8. Whom having not seen you love... Through, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy uns, in, uh, unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, we can have his joy. Even in the midst of trials, we can have his joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is the joy that we can experience. Not because of our trials, but in the midst of our trials. Look down in verse 11, in the middle of that verse. He testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. Over in chapter 4, we'll look at it in, in weeks to come, but in chapter 4, verse 12, we read these words. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. And that when his glory is revealed, then you also be glad with exceeding joy. 
If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Oh, we can rejoice. In the midst of the fiery trials of life, we can rejoice because we know there's glory coming out on the other side. He is going to get us through the trials. And we rejoice in the midst of it all. Oh, there's so much to say about that. But look again at chapter 1 of 1 Peter and look at verse 15. Verse 15. And Peter is saying to us what uh, the Lord has said even to the Hebrews of old. But as he who called you is holy, and also you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. There is our standard of life. And so as we know these things, we are to translate them into flesh and blood, into shoe leather, we are to live a holy life. We are to live a life that is pleasing to the Savior. As we live our lives in harmony with who He is, we are to live that life. And then last of all, there is that word love. And we find it in verse 22. And since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And so we find that uh, as we come to Jesus Christ, we are to know these things. We are to translate them into a life that is holy. And we do it by the Spirit of God. It's not by flesh and human effort. It is the Spirit of God who has taken residence in our lives that enables us, that empowers us to live this way. Who gives us a, a sense of hope that we have an inheritance in heaven. We are kept, there's trials, and we have to live a holy life. And then he says, here is a task, that you love one another. And, uh, and so we do that. We, I love you because I am commanded to love you. And you love me because you're commanded to love me. What did Jesus say about love? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And that's what Jesus is saying to us today. I believe. I, I believe in a day and age in which we live where so many churches are divided and and, and, and there's schisms and there's isms and all kinds of things happening in churches. I think what you have going here for you is a sense of unity and harmony that is a gift from God. Keep it going. How do you do it? By the Spirit of God that you love one another. I heard the story of a, of a man who had a rowboat. And in this rowboat, he was taking his his friend, his neighbor out one day out in a big lake and as he was taking his friend out on this rowboat in the midst of the big lake suddenly his, his neighbor, his friend stood up in the rowboat and the rowboat started tilting um, back and forth and his neighbor fell overboard and he went down under the water came up screaming, help, help, save me I can't swim and so the man with the rowboat reached out, grabbed him by the arm. He had an artificial limb and the arm came off. And the man went down a second time. Came back up out of the water screaming, help, help! I can't swim, save me! And so the man with the, who owned the rowboat reached out and grabbed him by the hair of the head and began to pull him to the boat. And you guessed it, he was wearing a, a wig. And the wig came off and he went down a third time. And a third time he comes up. And screaming, help, help, save me. And the old sailor reached out and grabbed him by the lapel of the coat and pulled him into the boat and said to him, how do you expect me to save you if you don't stick together? <laughs> you know what I believe? I believe that's what... That's part of the message God has for Monona Oaks Community Church. How 
you expect God to save you if you don't stick together. And the glue that brings us together is that love that we have for one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. The world sees it. The world sees what's happening. They come and they experience the kind of love and life and family that, that they don't see and find when they come to the church. And it's that love that binds us together. Well, there are three key words, mental pegs, that we need to hang our hat on if we're going to, if we're, if we're going to understand the Christian life and what our purpose is in life. And one of them, finally we got through, through, through one of them, that is, we are to know some things about our faith, about the Christian life. And, and this is Sunday, and this is the church, and I'm a preacher, and I want you to know these things. Peter wants you to know these things. God wants you to know these things. If we are going to be followers of Jesus Christ with influence. And next week as we come to church, we come to the Lord's table. And I want us to look at, uh, I may repackage it a little different, this, this idea of growing, this idea of showing. Now that we know some things, how do we grow? And how do we show forth the praises of him who called us into darkness, out of darkness into his marvelous light? Would you bow with me in prayer? Father God in heaven, now we thank you for the great salvation that you've given to us. How we thank you, Lord, for, for the gift of salvation and all the, the wonders of that grace in our lives. Lord, we don't deserve it. We don't even understand it. Uh, we really can't explain it. But we can experience it. The glorious work of your grace. We can know by the word of God some of the implications of it in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that as we move from this place this morning, this, this hour of worship, that you will just... Impress upon us that we, we are your people in this world, in this hour, to express that grace to others.